Welcome, everyone. We uh, apologize for the slight delay, but I think we're all ready to go now. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Future of Military Embedded Systems with an Open Standards-Based Digital Backbone, presented by AI Tech and Tech Briefs Media. I'm Bruce Bennett, editor of Tech Briefs Media, and I'll be your moderator today. This webinar will last approximately 30 minutes, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you may submit it at any time during the presentation by using the Ask a Question box on your screen. Our speaker will answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Those questions not addressed during the live event will be answered offline. You may also download a PDF of the presentation slides under the Event Resources tab on your screen. To view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you may have on your browser. At this time, I'd like to introduce, introduce today's speaker. Duke Wee Tron is Vice President of Global Marketing at AI Tech. He has more than two decades of experience in the aerospace, technology, and data analytics industries. Duke draws upon his previous strategic leadership and engineering roles at Collins Aerospace, Bombardier Aerospace, and Thales In-Flight Entertainment, an internet connectivity business unit, to put the issues facing today's military and defense engineers into perspective and discuss methods for successful market adaptation. AI Tech provides rugged COTS boards and embedded systems on industry standard open architectures, such as VME bus, VPX, compact PCI, and high-speed serial fabric-based computers and subsystems for use in defense, aerospace, and space flight applications. Now that you're familiar with our speaker's qualifications, let's begin today's presentation. Thank you, Bruce, for the uh, introduction. I uh, hope everyone can hear me well, uh, and welcome everyone to uh, this presentation from uh, AI Tech. Uh, from the introduction, you see the, the top here is open standard based uh, digital uh, backbone. Uh, what I'll be discussing today is how do we came to this conclusion? Um, I'll be talking about what it is, what it does, and share with you some, uh, some of the trends that we see that uh, lead us to, to this uh, digital backbone concept. We'll also be sharing some examples and talk about a few benefits uh, of, of these uh, concepts. So, uh, but before we get to why we came up with this uh, concept that we think it's going to address a lot of issues in the future, let's talk about a bit of some of the trends that lead us to these conclusions. Um, these are some of the trends that we see that we take into account um, to, to, uh, to come up with this uh, concept. So, and these are not necessarily new trends affecting our industry. But there's some trend that has been more like highlighted, accelerated, uh, uh, given the COVID last year, it highlighted and accelerated certain trends that, that we see. But it's also worth reminding us of how we got to where we are today. Um, the, so the, the first one here on this, this is the need for uh, accelerated need for computing. Uh, I think that's a very obvious one. I think we had a somewhat a disruption in the supply chain and, and uh, companies like GM and some other uh, companies not able to produce cars because of a shortage. And the need of that is it's, uh, increasing and not only increasing, but accelerated. And the, in the defense industry, this is uh, no different. Um, with the advent of more uh, um, computer uh, components, all these things, uh, cyber, cyber attack is also on the rise. Uh, this is also something that uh, that we we see highlighted, uh, not just in this industry but uh, across the board. Uh, militarization of space, um, militarization of space is. Uh, I mean, we've heard about the uh, the space force uh, some years ago, and also the other thing that we see is the the merger of technology for military and and space technology. We also see this uh, this trend uh, happening, cheaper and faster that's uh, always been there and it's forever will be there. Um, the use of cuts uh, everywhere, uh, commercial off the shelf. Uh, this is something was novel some uh, decades ago. Now it's, it's, uh, it's accepted uh, as, as a way of uh, ruggedized uh, cuts to, to use in military applications. 
and uh, uh, and it's really is now it's penetrating everywhere, including space. Um, SWAT C uh, um, um, is also something that has always been around, but uh, there's a greater need as well uh, for uh, for that. Um, and then some of the things that we see more recently are the, the, the adoption of open standard by government agency and the primes, and actually the entire supply chain uh, adopting open standards. And it's not just the U.S. Uh, market that with like Sosa, Phase, Vita, uh, all, uh, all these things, but we, we see an adoption worldwide. I think there's a recognition uh, that to uh, make things cheaper and faster, you need to have standard that uh, um, can, can work with different uh, vendors uh, together. And another thing that we, we see starting to happen a lot is uh, light, small, light, and fast, the unmanned solution. Um, I think with the comp increase in computing power, now all these things opening up. Um, and then the last trend that we see highlighting in the past year or so is the, the, the supply chain flexibility and agility is gonna be very important. Localization of the supply chain, uh, how the supply chain is, uh, each of the supply uh, chain in, um, company in the supply chains, it's taking greater um, uh, um, kind of a ownership of the systems and have to work with uh, many things. So these are some of the trends that kind of uh, make us consider, okay, what, what, do, what do we, what did the industry needs to start to ad adopt and what at AI Tech we're doing to, to address some of these things. Um, on the next slide here, uh, if you look at uh, just now, I'm going to dive into a couple of these uh, these keys uh, trends. the The future of the battlefield. If you look at this picture, a couple of common threats that you can you can conclude. One is you can see why the need of computing power is increasing. The other thing is artificial intelligence will be everywhere, and also a lot, it's going to be a lot of connected real time systems. Uh, that will be under a cyber security threats. And so you can see from this picture what the future of battlefield uh, uh, is, is going, all these things is, uh, is, is happening. Now, this leads to a rise in computing, uh, parallel computing. Um, and because of AI, because of real time, uh, something like a GPU, uh, which runs parallel computing, it's much more, it's becoming very popular now versus a more traditional CPU core. Um, and, and this is a trend that we see ac accelerating uh, as well. And an example of, uh, of uh, AI application and uh, parallel computing would be like a GPU based systems, uh, which is uh, one of the product that we see. Uh, there's a great, uh, quite a bit of demand uh, and People are realizing that a GPU is a very flexible uh, computing system for their applications. Cyber cybersecurity threats. I've uh, just talked about it, but I think maybe I just wanted to emphasize that uh, cybersecurity threats happens not only once the systems is deployed, but during the development of the system as well. Um, you, they can steal data, and uh, while you're developing a product. And and at the uh, tail end of it, they can get it to control of uh, your drone, a hijack, or, or disrupt, uh, and, and all these things. And so the the cybersecurity threat it's it's uh, it's something that uh, we take uh, very uh, seriously, and there are a lot of things that uh, we are doing uh, with it. This is an example of some of the uh, cyber protection technique that uh, that we use. Uh, authenticating software, protecting against network, uh, preventing uh, hardware cloning, protection storage, and, and uh, all these things. Okay. The um, the other uh, trend that we, that we we see is the rapid uh, deployment of a uh, uh, COTS and 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 everywhere. So COTS it's it's uh, started off as more millet mill in the uh, aero uh, environment. Um, and the benefit is very obvious. Um, we're talking about things doing something in months, uh, not in years or decades, uh, uh, leveraging the consumer product, uh, which is moving at a very uh, rapid pace, and recognize some of those things uh, for these applications is, is now accepted uh, practice. Uh, it's, it's, um, 
one other thing that we see also is moving in, in into the space domain that I've, uh, I've mentioned earlier. Um, also, it, uh, it bring the cost down uh, very significantly. We we'll talked about a lot less uh, uh, NRE, and it's also uh, more modular and easy, scalable. There's a lot more. Uh, you you we don't have all the uh, supply chain issue of obsolescence or less so. Uh, and the consumer product as opposed to uh, um, something that is um, custom made. Um, and so this is something that uh, uh, we're doing uh, quite a bit uh, as well. Um, the, and now the same trend is happening in space as well, um, cotton, cotton space. Uh, the benefit is even more, uh, um, uh, it's even bigger than in a mill level. We're we're talking about up to ninety percent cheaper versus the customs, simply because of the the number of quantities that the space components is a lot less than mill arrow, and uh, mill arrow is a lot less than the consumer product, and so the impact of uh, costs moving into space, uh, it's it's uh, even more pronounced uh, in, in this space. Um, and, and the same benefits uh, apply. And what we also find is actually uh, it's very reliable in space as well. It's, it's, um, um, at AI Tech, we've, we've had like 30 years with a trillion of mine flown without a single failure. Um, so it's proving to be very reliable as well. And in, in the space industry, also a lot of the, uh, uh, more, some of the recent things in space is that it's low orbit satellite. And so the requirement for some of the radiation protection and some of those things is not as stringent. So you can start to move uh, some mill aero product in, into the, the space market. The other uh, trend that I alluded earlier about swap C is, uh, but there's actually two trends within this one. There's one that's called more for same, and the other one is called same for less. And so more for same is exactly what it says, which is add more functionality into the same, um, um, the same uh, swap C. And this is a target that you see for large UAVs, uh, UGV, manned aircraft, manned tanks, combat vehicles, some of the bigger um, um, systems where weight is a bit less uh, critical, uh, for example, and you have same for less, is you can have the same functionality as what you do have today, uh, but in a much lighter uh, systems. And uh, this is when you target the small UAVs, robotics, smart soldier. Uh, these are the application that we see uh, starting to see two distinct uh, branch um, um, that we see in the in the uh, the, the products. The uh, the other trend is the introduction of SOSA phase Vita, um, and, and this is not the first time the industry has a uh, has a uh, open standard, uh, but this time it feels like the the momentum is there from the industry that is it's going to be adopting these standards uh, in in a much more uniform way. And one of the things that we find is that it's not only adopting uh, uniformly. It's adopting it at the entire supply chain uh, that we see. And also uh, what some of the interesting things that we see as well is the fact that there's adoption in multi-countries as well, uh, allied countries. Um, even though SOSA uh, is it, a U.S. standard, but we are, we are hearing a lot of companies from other, um, uh, other countries who, who wants to have uh, components now with SOSA standard as well. And the, the reason is that the supply chain is, is quite international in the uh, um, in, in military among allied uh, countries, and uh, it, it facilitates uh, uh, integrations. And the whole benefit of all do, doing all these things is a quicker time to market, lower development costs, uh, better integrations among uh, third party uh, and different vendors, and also it's it's uh, allow for scalability. Um, so this is a very, uh, very important development uh, that we see in, in an industry that um, opens the door for many things. So with all these trends, 
what does it mean? Um, if we take all these trends um, that uh, uh, I just I just talked about, all these accelerated trends and the open standard, what it really means is we go from COTS component, a world of COTS components to a world of COTS systems, um, where, or what we, we call that AI tech, uh, or kind of AI tech uh, digital backbone uh, concepts. Um, because all these, if you look at the cheaper and faster, you look at open standard, you look at the flexible supply chain, you look at all these trends, uh, we, we're trying to come up with a concept that solves all these problems simultaneously. So let me talk about what it is, is a digital backbone concept um, here. So we use the analogy of a, of a human, um, where you have the brain, you have sensors, uh, you have the actuations, and these are the inputs and the sensors, all the inputs and the brain. Um, you could connect, you don't connect the sensor and actuation directly to the brain uh, because it's not, uh, the difference in a, a military sense is it's not very upgradable. Uh, but when, once you have, you have a backbone, which is the data move in and out uh, from the brain, from the sensor to the actuators, you are essentially creating a, a digital communication um, highway. Uh, that can move data from sensor to the processing units, can move the processing units to the uh, the actuators, and also between the processing units and memory and storage uh, uh, itself as well. So that's what the a digital uh, um, backbone is, and it can be applied to all kinds can be all uh, all kinds of applications. So it's it's a very flexible uh, methodology uh, that you can have a cut products. So here, a combination of cost product and create a backbone so that you address the issue of upgradability and, and all these things. Um, depending on the market, we can optimize this by different swapsy. I mean, some for some application, it may be power, some application, it may be cost, some application may be weight, uh, maybe size. You can optimize it by performance, synchronizations, um, for scalability, um, a lot of the military programs have uh, decades of life, um, and one of the issues encountering today is to upgrade any system. It's very, very expensive about starting from scratch, and by having something that you can in, in, in simply plug into the backbone, now each time you can upgrade something without having to redesign entire systems uh, from scratch. The third thing about the digital backbone concept is it's a system that can be pre-integrated and fully verified. Uh, we're, we're talking about switches, endpoints, data conversions, um, some of the processing units, CPU, GPU, uh, FPGAs, memory storage, cameras, all these things can be pre-integrated and fully verified. Again, when you look at a, a a perspective of a, the way the supply chain is, uh, is, is laid out. Uh, it's very useful for the industry that each of the su supplier in the supply chain able to do that and plug into each other. Uh, it speed up the, the process uh, very, uh, significantly and it allows for a lot of great uh, upgradability. So this is what the, um, at the very high level, what the digital uh, backbone uh, concept is. Um, I think I'm, I'm sharing with you guys here some of the what, what it is. I think for how the details behind it, this is something that I'll, I'm going to ask that you guys contact AI Tech directly uh, to have this type of uh, information. Um, so let's let's sh uh, I want to share with you guys two use case. Uh, the first one is the the vertical lift and how a digital backbone. Um, is is designed a bill for our, our um, vertical lift. So if we take an example of um, of the next generation helicopter, uh, some of the key requirements uh, that they wanted to do is they wanted to have a, a helicopter uh, that uh, resolves some of the obsolescent issues. That there has the that's also upgradable uh, for future battlefield and it has greater range and affordability. So that's the goal of uh, this uh, program, as uh, known as uh, FARA, uh, FARA. Um, and it's used for uh, NATO countries. And so this is why the multinational uh, things is, is coming into play. And so a digital backbone concept fits very well into these things. 
uh, with a situation like this because it resolved the obsolescence issues and it's, it's, up, it's uh, upgradable. Uh, what's different in this particular, not, so, not different, but uh, what are some of the requirements that we designed for? Uh, for example, Swap C, we designed for uh, low weight uh, because this is a vertical lift and they want greater range. Uh, obviously, they, they spell out about affordability, so it's designed for affordability and low weight. We are in a concept, we design a, a modular um, concept and standard like SOSA, VITA and MOSA principle and standard is applied throughout. Without, without those standards, it would make it very difficult uh, to do. So uh, we are taking into account those standards and apply uh, into this uh, program. Uh, we uh, designed this, all the hardware to be DNA certified hardware and the software also. Uh, um, the standard that we were following. Um, other things on, on here, it's all the software will be uh, phase uh, conformant. And uh, again, this is allow for easy integration of, uh, of third party. And then, and then we have to protect the entire backbone, digital backbone as well from, uh, from cyber attack. And so, so you can see that uh, once you start to combine all these requirements and uh, all the trend that you see, um, the digital backbone address a lot of these issues uh, for it. Now, another example, uh, it would be a ground vehicle. Now, the ground vehicle is done to, uh, um, the difference here is, first of all, that uh, weight will be less uh, critical as a vertical lift, but the other thing is it probably requires a lot more uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities. Uh, they will have uh, autonomous uh, applications, and so the the swap C requirement is, is different, and also the uh, advanced uh, AI ML capabilities. Um, it uh, requires like a strong GP GPU, high higher speed, low latency transfer of data to to the backbone, and so the requirement of the backbone is different, but the concept stays the same. Um, and we talked about. Uh, upgradability, you can go from a 10 to 40 uh, uh, GPBS to 100 uh, in the future or higher. Um, again, the lifespan of these products are, are quite long. And so you can, you can, you, you building a digital backbone, you can upgrade uh, things uh, as, as uh, things develop. And this is some of the criticism of past programs without uh, standard and all these things is it's so expensive each time you do an, uh, an upgrade. And again, we, we you do a modular approach using the most of principle. Uh, we use phase conformant software, and of course, you need to protect everything with uh, um, cyber security. And um, this is a concept that's applied throughout the multiple uh, uh, segments. And we talk about vertical lifts. We talk about UAVs. Uh, drone is somewhere in between vertical lift and uh, G, uh, UGVs, uh, which is um, um, has a, some of the requirements for both of them. And uh, this is another segment that uh, we are investing in. And then uh, small satellite, the LEO stationary, uh, uh, sorry, the LEO uh, satellite. Uh, um, we're also developing a digital backbone for, for that. Um, and so you can see the use case, it's very broad, and it's, it's more of a principle um, that we try to address with all these uh, trends that, uh, that we see. Okay, and uh, so what is, what is the real benefit once we do all that? And so we try to measure against what we normally do, and in terms of cost reduction uh, versus legacy systems, uh, you're looking at uh, anywhere between 25 to, to 50 percent reduction in, in, in cost of using open standard, of using uh, a digital backbone concept. And it's not just a cost to the supply, it's actually a cost to the systems uh, of, uh, to be able to work with each other, the combination of SOSA, phase, and all these things. There's a significant uh, saving just in the development uh, portion of it as well. Um, it allows for ease of integrations of third party and from multiple, multiple countries as well. Uh, but there's also significant long-term benefit 
I didn't put here a percentage of, of, of savings. It could be because it could be unlimited. It depends really on how, how many times the, the, the program gets upgraded um, with a digital backbone uh, methodology. Um, you can add feature with uh, some uh, modification or some of small amount of work as opposed to do a complete redesign of the architecture. So there's significant uh, savings uh, and for the long term as well as uh, just the uh, not just the initial um, de development. Uh, and then the third benefit is not to be underestimated is once you because of the, the way the supply chain is is, uh, is working, um, everything is pre-integrated, verified, secure. Kind of like don't worry about it. Uh, when, when you can just plug into you have a whole system. Uh, verify it, it makes integration with other uh, uh, to big larger systems um, a lot easier uh, to do and that leads this is my last slide and uh, so thank you for listening and I'll be happy to take questions thank you mr. Tran for that most enlightening presentation uh, before we get to the first question here, I'd like to remind our audience that if you have a question, you may submit it simply by using the Ask a Question box on your screen. Okay, Mr. Tran, first question. Can you explain how digital backbone saves money and time? Uh, yeah, so there's a couple uh, ways it's, uh, it's, it saves uh, um one of the things that allow us to save money is is having these open standards. Um, when you have open standard, the integrations like Mosa, Phase, Vita, the integrations that you can do, uh, it's a lot simpler. Uh, you don't have to make modification to connectors or the software to write a, an extra layer of software to make sure two systems um, uh, speak to each other. Um, so this is one of the uh, um, the savings that you, we encounter. The the second thing is the um, because things are not plugged directly. If you look at from the sensor, of the actuator are not plugged directly into the brain. Uh, we actually pre make the digital backbone so that uh, everything that we add as as we develop the programs, the requirement is also changing, and so this allows for. Up, upgrade or change in the requirements through the development program a lot uh, a lot easier. Now, but that's only in the short term. I think what I've, I've just mentioned as well is is that if you look at the lifetime of the program, this is significantly more than just 25 to 50 percent. You, are, you um, by having all these things set in place, you are able to add functionality with uh, with, with a some amount of work but instead of having to design everything from scratch. Thank you. Next question. For digital backbone, why do you need the backbone? Why can't you just plug the sensors directly into the brain? Uh, in fact, you could, and that's sometimes that's what people are, are doing in the past. Uh, the problem is if you do that, um, each time you have to design the system from scratch. So, so one of the core, uh, the problem we're trying to solve is a cheaper, faster, and upgradability. And once you have a digital backbone, you're you're much more able to upgrade as opposed to if you you can plug directly the brain, but then it's it's kind of fixed. And so now you got to kind of change the brain, you got to change something, and these is the more expensive things that uh, that will do, that's required to be done. Thank you. We have a question here. You've been using the term COTS. Could you uh, explain what is COTS for some members of our yeah. audience? Yeah, uh, commercial off the shelf. So this is using uh, technology from NVIDIA, Intel, uh, AMD, uh, all these uh, uh, chip companies who uh, are ARM as well, um, who are at the forefront of uh, computing technology and it's moving very quickly. Or or you can go and try to do yourself, and that takes a lot longer, more expensive, and probably won't be as good. Um, and so the idea of commercial of the shell is leveraging those technology, but recognize it for application in space, recognize it for 
uh, and more, not simply ruggedizing. I think that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. But I think it, uh, leveraging those technology and, and use it uh, for military and, and uh, aerospace and, and space uh, application. Thank you. All right, our next question. In recent years, computing power has enabled more autonomy in unmanned systems. How does the digital backbone add to the benefits of these processing abilities in military applications? Yeah. So one of the things that you just say is uh, that the processing power is, in, uh, is increasing and allow for some of these things that is uh, that we can do. Uh, the real benefit of digital backbone is is around upgradability. And so whatever you, you think the processing power is fast today, 10 years from now, it's very slow compared to what the standard is 10 years from now. And so by having a digital backbone concept, now you can upgrade and you can even add even more functionality. So whatever it opens the door today, it opens the door for not only today, for, for the future. Um, so this is what it, it allowed us, uh, us, uh, us to, to do. And anything can, during the developing cycle, it can be added uh, uh, much quicker as well, to, as opposed to uh, some of the program in the past, where by the time uh, an aircraft is flown, already 10 years in development cycle and computer technology has moved so much in that, in that time. And so this is the, the, the true benefit of, of a digital backbone uh, concept. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. I'd like to thank Mr. Tran for giving us such an enlightening presentation. And I'd like to thank today's attendees for participating. That concludes today's webinar sponsored by AI Tech and Tech Briefs Media. <laughs>